One, two. Okay, uh, greetings all. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Virtual School of Internet Governance, Group G. Uh, we've been successfully launching our program and thank you all for coming today. Uh, the session will be recorded. Please mute your, vi your uh, mic during the session. I'm, uh, I'm gonna deviate from our normal uh, process and, and let Dr. Khan introduce himself. And, and as he's given me a license, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit if he's forgot a few things. Maybe he's a bit shy. So Dr. Khan, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. Well, first, I'm uh, happy to be with you today. Uh, by way of background, I was born in 1938 in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in, in, in the New York area. Uh, my father was a high school administrator, my mother a homemaker, and I graduated from City College of New York and took a job at Bell Laboratories in early 1960, during, during which time I got an NSF fellowship and entered graduate school in Princeton University later, later in that year. I subsequently earned a PhD in electrical engineering and joined after that the faculty at MIT in Cambridge, Mass, where I was mainly involved in the theoretical work in communications and I taught uh, numerous courses along the way. <clears throat> While in the faculty, it was suggested it would be useful for me to get some practical experience. And so I was pretty much a theoretician at that point. And I joined a small local firm and became responsible for the system design of the very first computer network based on the new concept of packet switching. Uh, that work was funded by an agency of the US Department of Defense, back then known as ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency. The network was sufficiently effective after we built it that I was invited to join the agency, which I did in late 1972. Uh, but by then it become known as DARPA rather than ARPA with the D standing for defense. Eventually became head of the information processing uh, techniques office there, which I ran for about six years. Uh, we started many innovative efforts there of which the internet is the most well known, but other important efforts included a VLSI infrastructure effort to encourage VLSI design in the research community in a program called Strategic Computing to enable high-performance computing, mainly for symbolic processing applications. After leaving DARPA in 1985, I started a nonprofit organization in the Washington, D.C. area known as CNRI, or Corporation for National Research Initiatives, to focus on national infrastructure kinds of problems. Among other things, with government support, we helped to put very high speed networking on the map in the US and then enabled the research community to get micro mechanical systems known as MEMS to get implemented. Indeed, CNRI undertook that responsibility and we've been doing that the past two decades. However, I believe our most important work has been on designing and developing an infrastructure for managing information represented in digital form. Um, this architecture is based on the notion of digital objects, which are uniquely and persistently identifiable to assist in enabling persistent access to digital information with intrinsic security based on the use of an integrated public key infrastructure. The relevant protocols support and identify a resolution system and also the ability to achieve interoperability between different types of information systems. We call this the digital object architecture or DOA and I've been working with many others to support its evolution and adoption. Most recently by a foundation known as the Donna Foundation, uh, which we established in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, I'm still very involved in the use of the DOA for all kinds of important and innovative applications. And I might add that I've had lots of help along the way, not only by the senior technical staff at CNRI and elsewhere, but also by Patrice Lyons, whose expertise in legal matters such as copyright and systems issues, such as architecture, have been essential to our progress. So I think I'll stop there. If, uh, if you want to add anything, please feel free, but I look forward to your questions. Thank great. you. Great, thank you. Uh, that's a great introduction. But I have to um, add to your, your uh, credentials, uh, there's a few things that you've been a recipient to. I think you're being modest the Presidential uh, Medal of Honor, which is not issued to anyone, the Turling Award, which I believe was 
was a co-award with Vint Cerf, uh, the Draper Prize, the inaugural induction into the ISOC Internet Hall of Fame. Uh, did I leave anything out, uh, Dr. Kahn? Yeah, probably too many to mention, um, but it was called the Presidential Medal of Freedom that I think you were talking about. Yes, I did. Many, I, you know, I know today is a funeral of Queen Elizabeth, but I was also a co-recipient of the very first Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. I think that's one of the wow. few awards just given out for engineering in the world. Um, and many, many others. I mean, you really want me to no. go through all of them? Great. Thank you so much. So let's turn to uh, our, our your focus. Like you said, this is a history module, but let's not focus on just the history. Let's, let's move forward on, on what you were saying at the beginning. So, so share with us your, your ideas on, on moving forward. Well, I, I mean, I can tell you what I've been, I've been working on. I mean, people often ask me to prognosticate of what's the future going to be like. And I'm usually hesitant to do that because, you know, most people's, uh, you know, guesses about the future turn out to be, to be wrong. I'm reminded that some of the history books I've written about airports said that you ought to put the airports at the intersection of busy, busy roads so that people can easily get to them. And, you know, Alexander Graham Bell's original thought about the telephone system was so that you could bring concerts into the home and things like that. So people often, you know, have, have, you know, wrong ideas about how the future will evolve. But what I can tell you is what I've been involved in. I mean, I, I know that the future is going to, going to be wireless. I think it's going to have more and more powerful computing. I know that information is going to play an important role. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of things. We'll have to see how they play out, like all the, the, uh, the buzz about cryptocurrencies and the like. But from my perspective, uh, the main thing that makes the internet so interesting is its ability to provide access to information, its ability to make information available, and its ability to support, you know, cooperation, coordination, interaction between different parties electronically and in real time. So um, we are in a stage right now where some 50 years after I was, I started working on this with my colleague, Vince Cerf, um, people are still pretty much relying on the use of fingers on keyboards and eyeballs on screens to make use of the internet. We had the notion years ago that if we could automate some of those functions, that it would be possible to sort of launch, you know, avatars, programs, we call them knowledge robots, into the net that could do your bidding. And so they could alert you when important things were happening. You could tell them what messages to send. They would send them, they could be reading your email and, and letting on your behalf, so it's all private to you letting you know what's happening so you wouldn't have to be glued, you know, with your eyes on the screen and your fingers on a keyboard. And that voice would be uh, eventually a primary means of interaction. So um, I think that uh, in order to, to do that, um, we, we came up with some architectural notions. We wrote a paper on the world of nobots back in the 80s. It came out at a time when uh, the very first uh, viruses, worms, Trojan horses, whatever you will, started to appear on the net for the first time. And there was some reluctance on the part of people to accept an idea that would have mobile programs show up on their, their machines. So what we decided to do back then was to uh, essentially delete the notion of mobility for mobile programs. It sounds like an oxymoron, I know. And to make it possible for people to just more easily access information if even without the mobility component of it uh, being present. And so that's what became the digital object architecture. And it consisted of a number of things, but ma mainly just like communications in the olden days used to be uh, focused on circuit switching. The essential of the computer networking era was a reliance on packet switching instead of circuits. So they could have little address packets and they could be routed very quickly without having to establish and maintain circuits, which could be highly inefficient. 
So in the digital object world, what we, we decided to do was formulate the notion of a digital object, which is basically information represented in digital form that's structured in a way that a computer can understand it and that it has associated with it a unique persistent identifier. So that if I wanted a piece of information, if I knew the identifier, I could just say, you know, please, you know, access the information with this identifier and it would find it wherever it is on the net. It could be a technology three generations in the future. It could be uh, anywhere in, in the world. And um, so that was, that was the, the hope that, that we had at that point. Um, and so we've been trying to develop that uh, over many years. There are a lot of applications. Many uh, people are using it for things that you probably wouldn't even recognize today, but you know, most of the scientific publications in the world use these identifiers. They don't resolve to digital objects in a form that are just understandable in my machines, but they may resolve to other things that you can look at on a screen and you know, use your fingers on the keyboard. So a lot of people use it to access web pages. A lot of people use it to access public keys. I mean, so there are a variety of things. But the basic idea was that it had digital objects, and those digital objects could be understood by a computer. And so there are things associated with it, like its metadata, um, maybe some of the, um, uh, the provenance of that information, where it came from, and the like. And we assume that every individual or every user of the network would themselves be represented in some form digitally so that you could in fact um, verify who the user was by virtue of public private key pair challenge uh, and, and base, it, base it on the assumption that people could also access the network as an anonymous figure if they wanted but um, they might not be able to access certain things where people wanted to know identity. So if it's a medical record, you clearly want to know who you're releasing it to. If it's bank information, you clearly want to know who it's being released to. But you know, if it was a temperature in uh, I don't know, Washington DC or Kuala Lumpur or wherever, maybe anybody can have that because it's considered publicly available. So it was that kind of a notion. The architecture itself, is based on the notion of repositories that would store these digital objects. They could be in today's cloud services and like, but had a defined interface, which is called the digital object interface protocol, which is an ideal protocol for allowing different kinds of information systems to work together because all the interactions on that protocol are based on identifiers. And those identifiers are not localized in time. Today, most of the identification on the internet is based on the use of the domain name, which was something I selected back in the 80s. It was designed by folks at University of Southern California. Uh, Paul Marco Petrus was involved as principal, so was John Postel and several others. But that was all tied to specifics like um, either an IP address, things could move, or uh, a name of a, a domain name of an organization like. Uh, you know, IBM.com or something like that. Not every organization is gonna last forever. We don't have any good examples of, of those in this country that have lasted more than a few hundred years for obvious reasons, but you know, things will change, things will come and go, and yet some of this information wants to be persistent. The other thing is you need a way of, of resolving these identifiers. Because so I just told you that, um, you know, Here's the identifier for a particular object. You still need to know how to achieve the how to achieve uh, an access to that object. So uh, you need to be able to find out where you go to access that object. And you may need to learn about what 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 kinds of security you need to provide in order to to get to it. So those are the key aspects of this architecture. Um, it was first released. Uh, uh, informally on the on the net, a lot of uh, documentation. Um, there uh, was a paper that uh, uh, I, that I wrote back in the early uh, 1990s with a gentleman from Berkeley who's chair of the CS department. Um, it's called a framework for distributed digital object services or something, some title like that. 
and it was later released as a seminal publication by Springer Verlag in a summary of uh, fundamental contributions to digital libraries. I think that was in 2006, and I believe it's on the, um, the, the uh, DOI Foundation's uh, website. You can access it there. Um, most of the scientific publications in the world, as I, as I mentioned, make use of these identifiers. So if you take a look at a tip, typical reference, uh, you don't want that reference at the back of a journal to suddenly become obsolete because the organization that made it available isn't accessible anymore by a domain and you really want a persistent identifier. And so that's why the public publishers were first out of the box to adopt it. But most of the libraries and universities around, around the globe have done, done so as well. Um, we have a, an open source package that we've made available uh, for free to people. It's kind of like something that, that bundles all of the protocols together so you don't have to worry about reading those documents and implementing it. Just like if you wanted to get on the web today, you don't have to read all the, you know, the web protocols. You can go get a web server and get started. Same thing here. And that open source package is called Cordra. CNRI makes it available and it's on the cordra.org uh, website that you run. So you can download it and, and make use of it. I think this is a really effective way to manage information going forward because it's 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 sort of timeless in, in a way. And it's got a lot of the architectural uh, attributes that Vint and I built into the original internet going forward. Namely, it's sort of independent of the underlying industrial technologies so that you can have a lot of different people building different versions of these as long as they adhere to the protocols. Um, and, uh, you know, I just uh, recommend that, you know, people who are interested in the future of managing information, not having to reinvent it every time you port it from one technology base to another, because you can simply transfer the digital objects, uh, take, a, take a look at it. So let me stop there for what I see is the future. I, I, I know there are going to be lots of other innovations, but uh, I'm going to let them speak for themselves. I, I'm just going to turn to uh, the rest of the uh, participants. Um, folks, uh, did you have any comments on what what uh, Dr. Khan was saying in terms of innovation? Uh, Bill, do you, I, I see you're muted, so I'm just waiting for you to unmute. Um, uh, I'm afraid I don't have any uh, great words of wisdom to contribute at this point. Sorry. Okay. Okay, no, no problem. So let's just, per okay, so going forward, um, so you were saying that you're, um, as we move uh, towards the, the vision of what you see the internet becoming, uh, so are, are you in, a, I guess, I'll, I'll be reflective here, are in a, a positive or, or, or pessimistic mute? You mean of whether this architecture will get adopted? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's that's right. Well, it really depends on, um, I think, the willingness of industry writ large to okay. um, buy into something that they didn't individually develop, um, but can participate in its evolution. Um, you know, when we did the original work on the internet, I think it was probably the view of the carriers around the world that whatever the future was like, they were going to invent it. But I don't think there was any good way that they would have come up with something quite as innovative as the internet was left to their own devices. I may be wrong about that. Um, but, you know, I remember being invited to a meeting uh, in the US when uh, you know, the internet was first becoming visible uh, to the carriers. And one of the questions that was raised at that meeting was, um, why do we need it? Because, you know, the carriers had their own approaches. Why wasn't something like ATM or SONA good enough? And the answer was, uh, I, I was actually agnostic on what the industry did. That was up to, you know, that was a business decisions, but um, whatever they did, they were going to need something like the internet architecture because of 
you know, the fact that technology changes, it evolves, and you're going to, you may have multiple versions of a system, even if it came out of one place, and they, they're not going to always want to make it compatible with version one from 100 years ago or 200 years ago or whenever. And so what, whatever they did, they would need something like this. Um, but uh, it didn't come to pass because they weren't about to dictate with the whole world as to what the architecture was. Um, and a few, a few years later, there was another meeting and they decided that that, that, that was right. The internet really wasn't important. And then the question was, how could they buy it? <laughs> said, well, that's, I suppose you wanted to buy the world economy. What would you buy? I mean, there's no shares in the world economy. There are a lot of individual shares and in individual companies. So I think it depends on what industry is willing to let happen. So the internet just kind of snuck up on carriers and I think they've adapted to it. They yeah. eventually yep. got the right notion that this was in fact a market and they should uh, they should leverage it. That's exactly what they did. And then to their credit, they're running it pretty well right now. Still a collaborative venture of, of sorts. So I think for the digital object stuff to really take on big time industry would have to get behind it. And the big obstacle will be that they didn't invent it themselves. How, how could they have done that originally? pretty hard, especially if you had to get all the countries of the world or the major ones to you know, coordinate with each other. And it's probably even more difficult now than it would have been uh, five years ago, just given the way things are in the world. So right, right. I, I think that's the real question. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good choice. The, the critical thing will be just like we had with the internet, how to make it possible for lots of participation from all the relevant parties around the world. But I think the, the the view of industry will be that whatever it is that happens, they'll want to probably only control it. And I don't think that's going to be possible and, simple, and make it global at the same time. Excellent. For, for yeah, the, I, the war, inf information is a very different commodity than just moving packets because you're dealing now with individuals, personal information, companies, personal information, as well as the stuff that they want to make public. So even when the web came along, you know, there's a lot of debate inside of individual companies. What is it that we're willing to make public on a public website? Uh -huh. They clearly didn't want to make their private plans available. They want to make their you know, ongoing contractual obligations public, but they may want to advertise what they're willing to sell, maybe some of the external uh, conditions that apply to it, but maybe not its internal product details. I mean, so it, it, dealing with information is very different from dealing with the communications aspect of moving bits that might even be encrypted from one place to another because privacy is a lot more important in the information world than it ever was for us in doing the internet initially. I, I think we have a question from Herv. Uh, Herv, can you unmic your, your mic since it's a small group? Uh, can you please go ahead and clarify your question you had in the chat here uh what is the impact of scientific publication on the internet governance so i i i, I want to give you the opportunity to clarify uh what you meant by that so herv can you unmic on on mic uh unmute your mic and and please t tell us where you're coming from Sorry, uh, Dr. Khan, it's taking a second for him to respond. I, I'm not hearing from him. So I, I see while he's queuing up, Stacy Gillinson from Australia has come in. She says, since we're uh, talking about current tech as well as histor history, I'm curious to know your overarching thoughts about AI. So, okay, moving forward on AI, metaverse, all that aspect of, of the future, which gets a lot of uh, leverage. Oh, sorry, Herv, he's from Cameroon. Herv, can, uh, Herv, can you uh, unmute your mic uh, before I go on to Stacy's uh, uh, comment about AI? I'll give you another second. Okay, I'm not getting you through. So, Herb, I'm going to go back to Stacy. Stacy, can you unmute your mic? Uh, maybe you can ask the question directly. Go ahead, Stacy. Hi. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your time. And uh, there are 
so many other students that uh, for often for work reasons can't be here tonight. So you'll be uh, seeing quite a bit to a quite a bit larger group, but not tonight. So I wish they could be here for questions. I have a special interest, probably because I have ADHD that I get kind of down rabbit holes um, in artificial intelligence. And I watched over the pandemic how while still rudimentary in many ways and arguably not AI in, in the fullest sense, uh, how AI has really blossomed. And I'm just curious to know more about where you see it heading and its influence across technology, because there's already, you know, interesting impacts in smaller ways, like the guy, I think he was in Colorado, who won an art show with a AI generated image and a lot of backlash against that. And I've seen that artists, different artist platforms are now banning AI imagery, you know, as often happens when a new tech comes along, ban the pencil, ban the printing press, ban the AI. I'd just like to know sort of where you see AI heading because you have such a rich history in this space. I'm, I'm curious to know kind of what your feeling is about there's a lot of people very positive on it and a lot of people who are very scared of it. And I'm trying to sort of weave my way into it. So thank you for that. Well, um, I have a long history of involvement with the AI field. I, I am not an AI researcher myself. Um, I never claimed to be, and I don't really work in that, that space, but I know a lot about it. When I was the, uh, director of the Information Processing Techniques Office at DARPA, uh, we funded most of the research in artificial intelligence in the US. Um, I organized a major program in strategic computing, which was really focused on trying to leverage the research being done in university laboratories and get it out into practice, which meant in inventing a whole new class of high performance computers, as well as all the infrastructure to support it. Um, so, uh, and even, even though I don't consider myself an AI researcher, a lot of people thought that I was sort of the mastermind of it, which I wasn't, but um, uh, I was one of the founding members uh, in, the, uh, in the AI community uh, when they uh, recognized their fellows. Um, and I wrote a paper actually at the request of one of the major associations in the US, um, because they thought I was masterminding this, they said, could you write a paper about sort of all of that? And I said, well, not really. And I said, because I don't consider that that uh, that should be attributed to me. It really was to the people who I knew very well that kind of pioneered the field, the Marvin Minsky's, the Alan Newell's, the John McCarthy's, the, um, the, the, that kind of those kind of folks really should do it. Feigenbaum, Alan Perlis, uh, Herb Simon. Um, they said, "Look, we just want a paper from you. Write about anything you want." And so I wrote a paper. It was called, uh, uh, I think, "AI: The Reality and the Myth," and it proceeded. This was circa 1986 or seven, I guess, to show what was real about AI and what was a myth, what was hype. And everybody basically said, no, 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 no. That's not the paper we wanted. We want to know what we, what was your master plan? And so that paper never got published. I think it was still an interesting one, but I'm going to build on that to answer your question because, you know, AI has had a kind of a, a mystery about it since day one. Um, you know, people sort of thought it was making machines just like human beings where in fact, it was just a way of thinking about how to use computers to do things that people thought you previously couldn't do. And so the world of symbolic processing was very different from the world of numeric processing to, to most scientists because they hadn't thought computers could, could act in that way. So in the early days when people were still trying to understand operating systems, which gave you the impression that a machine was sort of instantaneously reacting to you, even though there might've been multiple people on that machine at the same time, they thought that was artificial intelligence. At least it was all funded out of the AI programs. Um, and then once people understood, well, it's just a way of doing software engineering, then it suddenly wasn't AI anymore. It was just operating systems. And 
moved on to other things like speech understanding or image understanding or expert systems and the like. But each of those, when you got to understand them, it was again, just another way of implementing a symbolic processing application. And, and we moved on and on. Today, you're into deep learning and you know, neural nets and a variety of other techniques, which are again, going to turn out to be, you know, engineering artifacts once people understand them fully and people will move on to other things. Uh, I remember talking with Marvin Minsky in the very early days of the speech understanding program. And he said, well, he says, I suppose that's a, a good thing to do, which didn't seem like a very positive comment to me at the time. And I said, why did you say that? He says, well, he said, uh, I, he says, it's probably got socially redeeming value, but it's not the core problem of AI. And he said, what do you think the core problem of AI is? He says, it's understanding human consciousness and how people think and that's, that's sort of where his head was focused on. But I think it, it's fair to say that many people in that community back in the 50s, early 60s, when it was being formulated, thought that the, the basic problems of getting computers to think would be solved in a few decades. Well, here we are, what, you know, many, many more than a few decades beyond. Um, and it may be, you know, 100 years would have been too short an, an estimate. So we really don't know. But every time, you know, they make progress in that field, and they say, oh, that's how you do it. So then it becomes engineering and you're on to the next generation. So I, I think I can't give you a very crisp answer to what the future will be. But I think it's a good paradigm to learning how to think creatively about how to solve problems that people can typically solve using computers. Great, thank you, Stacy. Is, is there a follow-up question uh, based on Dr. Khan's comments? Go ahead, Stacy. Just briefly, thank you for that. Uh, appreciate to understand more fully your involvement with that as well. And uh, I will do a little more research on the history myself now that I have a better sense of it. Um, I suppose my follow-up question would simply be, um, you talk about it, you know, once we once we have it happen, it becomes an engineering problem and we move on to, to the next, the next uh, unsolved task. Where do you see it headed in the next few years? There's such a push right now and there's so much press around it and so much intrigue and fear. Where do you see this sort of going over the next couple of years? What's going to happen? in your opinion anyway. Well, 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 this is again a prognostication, which I- Those are the best, uh, go for it. <laughs> no, well, I'm loath to do because it'll be wrong, whatever, whatever it is. I don't know what, what is, what I, what I can say that I'm fairly confident about is that uh, creative people, if they get funded adequately, will come up with ideas, many of which we can't currently imagine, and that will set the tone and the trajectory for where this field goes in the future. Uh, I think the, the extent of the value of AI has been to nurture a community of people who have learned to think more creatively about the use of computers than I think any of the original pioneers who viewed it as a numerical calculating machine ever envisioned and it's it's had a whole history of innovative capabilities are we even in the areas where we made a lot of progress have we solved the problems no um we made a lot of progress in speech understanding uh, you can talk to a lot of systems today including many of the ones on your telephone even with its limited bandwidth um but uh even so computers will still have a tough time understanding uh, things the way people do until we figure out how to get them to understand them the way people do, because we're the ones that are gonna be interpreting how well it's working, I suspect. So, um, you know, just take simple English expression, time flies like an arrow. Okay, you know what that means. Uh, but if you give it to a computer, it's going to say, uh, hmm, uh, if you wanted to time a fly, 
Uh, you better time, you better do it like an arrow or there's a category of flies called time flies that happen to like arrows. And I mean, there are gonna be a variety of interpretations of these things or sometimes it's just the, you know, going from the acoustics to the natural language, you know, that's a nice peach. Is it a nice piece of fruit called a peach? Is it a nice piece of sand called a beach? Is it a very cold peach, like an ice peach? I just, just the movement of it from one genre to the other simply requires a lot of context to know exactly what was intended. And, you know, we make so much use of ellipsis and anaphoric reference in our normal conversational speech. It's very hard for, you know, computer programs to do that. I mean, in the early days, for example, if you said something like, uh, you know, Bob met Andre, after which they went to lunch, you know what that means. But if you gave it to a computer in the early days, it would say, Who the, who's they? And it can't find a they. If, if it said Bob and Andre met, after which they went to lunch, say, oh, they is Bob and Andre. But, uh, you know, those are things that, that are still in, in the future for many of the new applications. Sure. Indeed. I appreciate that. Thank you, actually. I, I think that was the answer I was looking for. Thank you. I would, Thank you. I would say, if I can jump in here, basically, yeah, speech recognition at the moment is a matter of being able to recognize a very small set of expected words and phrases and respond to Sorry, them. We lost you, Bill. I, I think I'm sorry, Bill. We lost you a bit. Can you start again? I can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Um, maybe, maybe it's you, Glenn. Um, yeah, might be. Yeah, the uh, speech recognition can recognize a, a small set of things, but we're, uh, I think, a very long way from anything on a computer that that would even come close to passing a Turing test. And it just, you can tell when you're talking to a computer just by saying something unexpected and it doesn't say, you know, what the devil did you mean by that? It just freezes up because it doesn't know how to cope once it gets outside of its very small uh, repertoire. Thank well, you. I, I, I think, um, Bill, you know, I, I think it's gone beyond just recognizing individual words. I mean, they can deal with continuous speech or, and, and transitions and, and things like that. It's just that some utterances are pretty simple to parse and figure out what they mean. And some get very complicated. I mean, and you may be able to parse it, but you don't know what, what, to, what how to respond. You know, if I ask you the question, um, what's this, the Shakespearean? And so, I guess it was Shakespeare. How do I, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. You know, are you asking for permission? Uh, are you asking for an analysis? I mean, you know, some of the more philosophical statements, um, you really have no way to get computers to deal with unless somebody figures out how to invent a personality in a computer that would match what a person might say, and then you're getting closer to the Turing test. Right. Um, let me turn back to um, uh, a question that Herb had, but I think he's got a problem with his mic. Uh, his audio came in. Uh, Herb, did you want to uh, try your mic again? He's coming in from Cameroon. Let's give him a second. Uh, because I'm not a hundred percent sure what his question actually he 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 writes in the chat, uh, Dr. Khan. What mm -hmm. is the impact of scientific publication of the internet governance? I'm not might be his his French translation, but I'm not I, I'm 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 drawing a blank on exactly I, I, what he means. Yeah, I I don't know what he means either. And um, scientific publication. I mean, you can ask the question about scientific publication for anything. I mean, what is the impact of scientific publication? And, you know, it's 
it's meaningful only if the publication is written in a coherent fashion, only if the data behind it is, you know, really either accessible or uh, reliable, um, and only if it's accessible uh, to people who can read and understand it. Uh, internet governance is a whole different uh, kettle of fish, so to speak, but I mean, to me, I, I've never actually liked the terminology much because okay. the, the internet is really just the, the name of a technology that's used to link together a lot of different networks and computers and, and make these applications available. And so the idea of governance is not a very well-defined notion if you take it as a holistic view. Um, you know, what, what does it mean to govern govern your publication? Well, it may make sense to a party who is a publisher and wants to have its own rules for their publication, but not for you in writing it necessarily. So, um, and you now there's never been any real uh, consensus on what that means because frankly, the internet is a big cooperative activity. I mean, it just benefits everybody to make it work but you know, countries that uh, don't want to participate can, in fact, unplug themselves from the, the connectable parts. And they probably can't do much with all the radio waves that uh, impinge on them from satellites or, you know, or, or from without their boundary or, or even inside. But um, you know, the, for the most part, it works because people want it to work. Right. Um, and. Uh, if they ever didn't want it to work, uh, it would probably end up not being very useful, except to those smaller set of people that want it to work. So we'll have to see how it plays out. But um, I, I just have trouble with the actual terminology itself. It makes sense for a lot of people because they don't know what it is. So they, if you tell them you're having a meeting on internet governance, they want to show up, make sure they understand what it is you're talking about. That nothing bad happens that's going to govern them, but I don't think it really means very much per se. Okay, great. Uh, I'm not getting a follow up with Herb and I'm not getting his audio, but Andre's in the queue and Andre's uh, a professor formerly from the uh, constitutional law from the University of Moscow. That's a long story, but Andre, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and I think my the uh, question is connected to with, with the, what was asked uh, before, actually about the impact of scientific public not not the publication actually, but uh, let's consider the role of the academic community in uh, in internet governance. I belong to academic community, of course. And, uh, a lot of people that. Uh, connected with this wonderful initiative to hold the virtual school of internet governance also connected with the uh, uh, with the internet governance and the internet governance and I think that uh, that's my opinion that uh, the role of uh, academic community will be uh, much more uh, and uh, it will be increased from time to time. And uh, I think uh, it's really important to have a new uh, developments in scientific publications, not only in different multidisciplinary areas. For example, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm de dealing with the, the legal impact of internet governance. Uh, from other, not, not only for technical perspective, not only for, for, for example, for academic perspective, but for any, uh, from different perspectives, we need to have uh, uh, even multidisciplinary uh, approach in uh, in publications, in uh, occasions like this, and uh, in uh, others. And uh, I'm also working on different initiatives on uh, like this. But my question is also about the future. Actually, uh, uh, my uh, question to Professor Kana uh, uh, as well. Uh, could you please tell me uh, what will happen if internet will be fragmented in different parts? Uh, some people are predicting this fragmentation. Uh, personally, I think that this fragmentation is 
uh, danger for all the humanity information sphere because the internet is the uh, it is uh, uh, very important to us when when we have it in the whole when we have the possibility to connect people from different parts of the world uh, but this fragmentation is the most uh, uh, serious danger as I can say uh, what's your opinion thank you very much well, I think I, I think what you know you have to wait and see you know what what happens but uh, I think that there hasn't been a lot of wellspring of uh, concern about fragmenting the internet so far simply because people can apply the controls within their own country. You know, so um, it would be like equivalent of saying, let's shut down all air travel, you know, or, or we'll fragment air travel. So there are only a few countries that can have travel between them because you can always put the, 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 the protections at the border of your own country. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why it's less likely to fragment but, um, you know, in the early days when we were designing the protocols, um, you know, the, there was a major push to allow for different host protocols in computers around the world, which led people to propose that what we should be focusing on was protocol translation. So if you were speaking one protocol and then somebody else was speaking a different one, you know, the protocols would get automatically translated from one to the other, so it would just continue to work. But, you know, it's sort of like, you know, how, how about if we had a telephone system that did automatic translation from a protocol called English to a protocol called French or Spanish or Russian or Chinese? You know, it's not clear that you could make that work in every case, and you didn't want to have things break down because the infrastructure itself wouldn't support what you want to do. Um, so uh, that, that's one of the, the, the big concerns. But the other thing that, that's interesting is that if we have something, we have a consensus that, that the only thing that we can manage to do is share information. That's really the value of the net to the, the research community at some level. There's more than just this one, but at, at the base level, it's the ability to share information that makes that community as powerful as it is intellectually. Um, if you couldn't do that because the internet wouldn't allow the data to flow, um, that would be one thing. On the other hand, if you could say, okay, I have an identifier for digital object, I don't know where it is, and I don't know how I get there, and I don't know who can get there, but if I can get an intermediary to somehow get me that information and somehow forward it. I can imagine that working. It wouldn't be my first choice. Uh, and it certainly would preclude an awful lot of other things that might be very useful, like direct uh, you know, coordination kinds of activities where you have multiple programs or users in different places all simultaneously cooperating on something. I think it would make it very different, difficult for businesses to engage in global transactions. Um, that way because you'd have intermediaries that always be privy to things that they might consider private and don't want to make public or make available to any other party but themselves. Um, on the other hand, I suppose it could cut down on certain illegal activities, which would be the only good thing I could see out of that. But uh, I think, you know, we've been very fortunate in, in 50 years since we first developed the protocols we haven't seen the internet fragment. Uh, we have seen attempts to take different approaches, but they haven't worked because all of the all of the alternatives have been inefficient or unworkable. And uh, hopefully, we won't have to deal with that problem going forward. If we do, well, I'm sure there's enough innovation in the community to figure out what would come next. But we be in for a period of disruption, I think, until we figure that out. Great, thank you. Uh, we have one more 
time for one more question. Uh, uh, I'll toss it out to the group. Uh, if you don't have a final question, I'll just ask uh, Dr. Khan to do a wrap up. Uh, anyone else uh, before I turn to Dr. Khan? Uh, Bill, Andre, Irv? No, okay, I think we're good. So is there any final comments that you would like to, to share with us before we conclude? Well, one of the things I'd like to recommend is that you take a look at a paper that uh, I wrote with Patrice Lyons, who I mentioned in my opening remarks. It's called Blocks as Digital Entities. It's, it's about the evolution of the use of that term because of all the hype in the blockchain world. Simply okay. pointing out that what blockchain is doing is not really new. It's, it's something that we've known about for a very long time. It's built into, I mean, it, you can do it yourself automatically in the digital object stuff by simply having pointers from one digital object to other digital objects. And, and you could organize it yourself or somebody else can, but it wasn't brand new. Um, there's a paper that we wrote. Again, you can find these on the net. It's called Representing Value with Digital Objects. And it was, I think, the very first paper that was written uh, to try and show that Digital objects didn't have to be all about copyright material. Didn't have to be about, you know, publications and songs. It could be about, uh, it didn't have to be about the, the kind of things that you typically think of as subject to copyright. But it could be about, you know, value of that, as in cryptocurrency. And we actually had a, a, a patent filing on that back in 2003 or four that they said was already embedded in the digital object architecture. So we decided not to pursue it any further rather than argue against the interest. Um, so, and, and there are also lots of things that might have, um, that might have uh, interest to parties, but don't have intrinsic value and don't have copyright rights to it. You know, like uh, a contract, you know, may have, you know, interest or laws, public laws, things like, like that, written it in certain forms that don't that aren't subject to copyright. So um, that's one thing I'd like to do. Take a look at those papers. Um, if you'd like, I can send in the actual uh, citation for it. I can't generate it instantaneously. You could have to look it up. Um, let's see. I think the more that we can get the research community interested in understanding how to manage information rather than just making use of what's out there, what industry has provided, whether it's on the web or what else would be useful. I mean, I would, I would think this would be something the web community would want to look at as well. Um, I think that uh, um, one thing that I'm pretty sure of is that we're gonna be surprised by what the, um, the research community comes up with in the coming decades because you know, if you if you even look at you know the iterations of the internet over over the years, lots of things have happened that people thought, "Gee, not really surprising." Didn't think you could do that, um, and, and and see where things go. Um, you know, I I would hope that as time goes on, we will move more in the direction of using mobile programs to do our bidding, so we don't have to stay glued to our laptops and screens and be typing all the time, but um, I think that's going to require a better understanding of how to cope with all the bad things that can go wrong. That's a good paradigm for any architectural development, um, uh, namely to make sure that you look at all the vulnerabilities before you proceed. There could have been lots more things we did with the internet in the early days, but nobody even thought it might be possible or necessary. And so we did what we could with whatever resources were available. And once it became widely adopted, then people said, oh, but you didn't deal with this issue. You didn't deal with that issue. Yeah, that's true. Couldn't deal with every issue up front when you're just trying to show that you can do a basic capability. But uh, I think that's a good way to think about architecture in general. It's a good way to think about infrastructure in particular. Great. 
Great, thank you. Um, this has been quite illuminating. Um, I just want to turn to anyone else for a kind of final comment, Bill, Andre, Herb, or, or Stacy. Uh, if not, uh, I will conclude the call today. Uh, thank you so much. This is a recording that we shared on the YouTube for the rest of the students. And again, thank you so much for, for your time today. It was quite illuminating. And uh, again, this will conclude the call today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Glenn. Happy to be with you. Thank you. All the best.